It's good to see this place crowded. Good to see the balcony, everybody coming. And a couple of our hymn leaders are not here yet. They're in the minibus, but they're on their way. So let's settle our hearts by singing, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Everyone singing and clapping their hands. Right then, praise the Lord. Seek. twice through and this time I want to see everybody up there right to the very back clapping their hands right then come on see
keep on singing will take off. <laughs> this stage of the service, the whole program's changed tonight because of time and different people that are taking part. With us tonight, the echoes of grace, they're always a blessing to us when they come. And they're going to come now and sing two pieces. Then later on in the service, one of the sisters is going to briefly bring a word of testimony. And then they're going to sing one piece again. And then we're bringing a message on Christ healing the leper. But now we'll have the echoes of grace. Yeah. 
Hey, man, they've been creased the last time they were here. <laughs> Everybody said that was lovely. We enjoyed it. They're warm, and they've got the anointing of the Holy Spirit with them. John Campbell is going to lead you in a chorus as the time is going. The way you were singing at the beginning of the night, I don't know, whenever I come to the offering, I think a singing goes down. I don't know why it's the fact that their money goes down along with it. So come on, let's really sing it. Come on. Our sister is going to come now and give a brief word of testimony. Look at all these faces. Well, I thank and praise God for the privilege that is mine tonight, that I'm able to stand here and give a word of testimony to the saving and keeping power of my Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And I can say the truth that the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows, and that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And I was a backslider for 25 years, and it was through the illness of my husband that I came back to the Lord. When I heard that my husband had only three months to live, I was really distracted, for I knew if he died in his sins, he was on his way to hell. And when he lay in the Royal Victoria, your hospital, I sent everybody that I knew that was saved to go up and speak to him. Now, my husband resented this very much. He used to say to me, Doreen, don't be sending no more people up to me. I don't do anybody any harm. But sure, none of us do anybody any harm. But we still need to be saved. You can pay into your church, you can go to your church, but you still need to be saved. And I knew this. And when he came out of the hospital that Monday, he was no near the kingdom. And I knew time was running out for him. And I said to my father, what am I going to do? Time's running out for Jordy, and he's still not saved. He says, daughter, maybe the Lord's waiting on you. And the next day I was on the Shankill Road and I met another lovely child of God. And she said exactly the same words to me as what my father said. Doreen, maybe the Lord's waiting on you. Right. And that day the Holy Spirit had been taking a deal with me for a long time. And that Wednesday afternoon I went upstairs and into the back bedroom. I got down my knees and he just says, Lord, here I am. I'm like the prodigal, I'm coming home. And I really poured my heart out onto the Lord that day. 
and my husband was laying in the front bedroom and I said to him, Jordy, I've just come back to the Lord. And he says, that's good, Doreen, I'll buy you a Bible. Now, two nights later, I was reading the Bible and Jordy was watching television. And I don't know to this day what verse of scripture I read out to him. He said to me, Doreen, that's lovely. Turn off the television and read me the whole chapter. And I read him the whole chapter. And to that, I used to read to him twice a day. And I thank and praise God that the Lord saved him before he died. He only got three months, but the Lord gave him nine. And he was a wonderful witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't even brought up in a Christian home. He hadn't been at meeting for years or church, but yet he was a wonderful witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I come back to the Lord on the 21st of March, 1973. My husband got saved on the 28th of March, 1973. And on the 29th of March, 1973, my only child was killed in a car crash. Now, my son was almost 19 when he died, and my son, husband was 49 when he died. There was 30 years of an age difference, but sinner our friends, when it came to death, there was no age difference. Uh -huh. And I would urge anybody here tonight, if you're not saved, death can take you at a moment's notice. My son went out in the best of health and come back to me in a box. But I thank and praise God that I'm going to meet them again someday. And people used to say to me, how did you come through it? Without the Lord Jesus, Christ I am nothing uh -huh. without the Lord I couldn't have come through it it was only him that brought me through it and I can say every night when I used to be frightened on my own I can say now Lord in thy presence is fullness of joy I love the Lord from the very depths of my being and I would urge anybody here tonight if you don't know my Jesus you don't know what you're missing he's worth a servant earthly friends will fail you but he's always there when things go wrong he never leaves us nor he never forsakes us indeed I have proved him to be the friend that sticketh closer than any brother and by his grace I mean to <laughs> I was once a sinner, but I came pardon to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that He always kept His word. Fathers and you name, written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. 
Everybody said it was really lovely and a lovely word of testimony. If you have your Bible with you, I would like to invite your attention to the first chapter of Mark's Gospel, beginning to read at verse 40 until the end. Mark chapter 1 and verse 40. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away. And saith unto him, See, thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city but was without in desert places. And they came to him from every quarter. We know tonight that the Holy Spirit will bless the reading of his own word. Shall we stand for a moment? Father, help me to speak well of thy Son tonight. And may men and women see him in all his beauty. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. You may be seated. The Jewish Talmud, which contains the sayings of the rabbis and not the sayings of God declares this precept. These four are reckoned as dead. The blind, the leper, the poor, and the childless. It was a harsh, cruel law without pity and without feeling. Even in the early Latin church, when a man was stricken with leprosy, they celebrated the last rites and read the burial service over him. And this ghastly usage was in entire accordance with the Jewish sentiment. The leper was an outcast. He had to live apart Even as of old in Leviticus chapter 13, he had been banished from the camp of Israel. So in later days, he was not allowed to enter a walled town. The leper had to rend his garments, go bareheaded, wear a covering over his mouth, and cry in a husky, crooky voice, unclean, unclean. Listen to the historical statements of some Jewish rabbis concerning the leper. Rabbi Johanan says, If the wind blows from his direction, he must come no nearer than four cubits. Rabbi Simeon says, No nearer than a hundred cubits. However, he was admitted to the synagogue. But he must be the first to enter and the last to leave and must occupy a special enclosure ten hand lengths high and four cubits broad. If he should transgress his limits, the penalty was forty stripes. This was the law of the Talmud. No wonder our Lord was continually angry with the Pharisees. Men who loved to be called rabbis in the streets. 
You remember the day the Pharisees saw his disciples eating bread with unwashed hands. They were horrified. They complained to Jesus and said, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But Jesus answered, Why do ye transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In other words, Jesus said, that's what I think of your Talmud. It was one of these poor creatures that visited our Lord Jesus Christ in the city of Galilee. Regardless of legal restrictions, he entered the city and made his way along the street. He left pollution on his trail, yet his progress was not hindered. Everybody stood aside. None would lay a hand on him. They were afraid of being contaminated. If they did... They would have to bathe themselves in running water, wash all their clothes and be unclean until the evening. Reaching the place where Jesus was, he knelt before him, flung himself on his face and cried, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Had Jesus been a rabbi, he would have recoiled in disgust and indignation. Rabbi Meir would not eat eggs from a street where there was a leper. Rabbi Eliezer, when he saw a leper, hit himself. Rabbi Lahish, when he saw one, pelted him a stone, saying, Away to thine own place, lest thou pollute others. But Mark in his gospel gives us a beautiful picture of Christ's reaction. He says, and Jesus moved with compassion. Hallelujah. Jesus moved with compassion. Put forth his hand and touched him saying, I will be thou clean. The sight of this poor wretch, instead of filling him with nausea and revulsion, broke our master down. He was moved with compassion and immediately his hand went out to touch and comfort him. The disciples were aghast and amazed. Did he not know he was making himself unclean by touching him and standing near him? What love, what compassion. The poor leper had almost forgotten what the touch of a hand felt like. He had lived ever since his disease separated from others. He had lost the embraces of his wife and his children. He had to walk alone in crowds and had a heart-chilling circle cleared around him everywhere. But now this man, Jesus, stretches out his hand across the dreary gulf and lets him feel once more the sweetness of a warm and gentle touch. Praise God tonight. It was half the cure. It was the complete clearing away of the last film of the cloud of doubt as to the will of Jesus in the leper's mind. It answered that if thou wilt by something that spoke louder than any word. What a Christ! He laid his hand on the rotting flesh and said, I will be thou clean. Will you say praise the Lord? I would like to talk a little bit more on the thought of Christ touching the leper. By that touch, he openly proclaimed himself the priest. You see, the law declared the only persons allowed to touch lepers were the priests. For they had to examine them after a period of time and pronounce them clean and unclean. But here Christ takes the office of priest. This was wonderful. 
But it was also dangerous. I believe that is why our Lord strictly told the leper to tell no man of his cure, but to go first to the temple and show himself to the priest and offer the necessary offerings that Moses had commanded regarding the cleansing of leprosy. Now there's a lesson here that we Christians ought to learn from our Lord's example. Though he was God, he was also man. And being a man, Jesus recognized constituted authority. Let me emphasize that. Constituted authority. Now if our Lord had said to the leper, now you're healed, go your way. It would have confirmed the suspicion that he made light of the law and its ordinances and encouraged the violation of the law. The old Pharisees would then have had a loophole and a pretext for accusing him and hindering him in the exercise of his wonderful ministry. But Jesus said to him, Tell no man, go first and show yourself to the priest. Our Lord Jesus did desire the miracle to be known, but not till it was authoritatively certified. How different he is to some of his servants today who claim to have miracles. And when these people go to the doctor, the doctor says they have the same complaint. But Jesus wasn't afraid to tell the man, go to the priest and get authoritatively certified that you're healed. You see, when the power of God is in your ministry and in your life, you don't need to be afraid of anybody and you don't need to fake any miracles or tell any stories. Will you say amen to that? But not only did he want it to be authoritatively certified, it was for the leper's advantage too that he should have the official certificate since he would not be restored to society without it. However, I am sorry to tell you, and I probably would have done the same, the leper is so full of joy and so full of gratitude blazed the testimony of his healing far and wide. And would you blame him? He wasn't worried about authoritatively being certified. and He wasn't even worried about a certificate. But the Lord was. And the leper so blessed, so healed, so transformed, had to tell it to everybody. Well, of course, this caused the multitudes to flock to Jesus when the master was wanting a time of quiet and solitude. And the news of the leper's cleansing probably reached the priest before he did. And no doubt they were out to destroy the ministry of Jesus. But to get back to my point, by touching the leper, Jesus proclaimed himself the priest. And tonight, he is our great high priest. Still full of compassion and still moved with compassion. For he's interceding for us at the right hand of the majesty on high. Pastor, pray for me that I'll go on. I don't need to pray for you. He is. Will you say praise the Lord? His prayers are more effective than mine. Hallelujah. Why if I went on with God for 27 years. Because there's one in the glory tonight. Who is my great high priest. That's why I'm going on. Listen to Paul in Hebrews 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. That is passed into the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest. Which cannot be touched. With the feelings of our infirmities. But was in all points. Tempted like as we are. Yet. Without sin. That's why tonight he understands us. That's why he feels for us. That's why he's so patient and loving with us. Because he. The Almighty One took upon Himself flesh and form like ours and lived in that body of flesh a sinless, spotless, overcoming life. Brother, tonight listening to me, what uncleanness is in your life? Sister, what scab of leprosy is hidden under the veneer of your respectability? 
I tell you, if you come to Jesus like the leper came in humility and in worship, the same hand that stretched out to touch the leper, making him whole, will touch you. And you'll be clean from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And listen, any child of God sitting in this meeting tonight will tell you the first Feelings of the power of the precious blood is something that you'll never forget for the rest of your life. To be clean from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. That's what he can do for you tonight. There are drug addicts sitting in this meeting tonight. They can tell you that. There are alcoholics sitting in this meeting tonight. They can tell you that. There are drunkards sitting here tonight transformed by grace. There were potential suicides sitting in this gathering tonight. And every one of them, they went to the priest. And he pronounced them clean. Isn't he lovely? Isn't he lovely? Let me go on. Some commentators feel that whoever preaches on leprosy as a type of sin is stretching the point a bit too far. Now I thought about this this afternoon and I examined it to see if there was any actual scripture that typified leprosy as sin. And I'm going to be honest, I had a job to find it, but I found it. There is. If you notice in Psalm 51... David's great psalm of repentance after his adultery with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah, he mentions in the seventh verse a word called hyssop. Hyssop. Listen to what he says. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than the snow. Now, if you will read Leviticus chapter 14 tonight, which deals with the cleansing of the leper, you will find that if a leper discovered in some wonderful way that his leprosy was healed, the priest commanded him to take two live sparrows that were without blemish and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. This word hyssop. Then one of the birds had to be killed over a cup of spring water so that the blood of the bird might discolor the water. After that, the living bird with a little scarlet wool and a bunch of hyssop must be fastened to a cedar stick. Then dipped in the water and blood which the priest sprinkled on the leper seven times. And pronounced them clean. What a strange custom you say. Yes. It, it was really a, a strange custom. But there was a definite purpose to it. Would you let me try and use my imagination about this? Well first of all the cedar wood. You'll see it outside our church when you go out. That's why it's kept the weather well. The cedar wood signified the restoring of the leper. To his strength and soundness. For cedar wood is not the sort. To rot. Or to putrefy. Mm -hmm. Secondly the scarlet wool signified. Notice the scarlet wool. Signified the leper recovering his florid color again. For the leprosy made him white as snow. And thirdly the hyssop. Which was really a perfume. The hyssop, which was really a perfume, had a sweet smell, symbolized the removing of the stench which commonly attended the leprosy. And fourthly, if you notice, the priest had to sprinkle the leper seven times. Well, you that know about Bible numerals, know that seven is God's number for completeness and for rest. If you remember, Elisha told Naaman to dip in Jordan seven times and Naaman was a leper. And his flesh became the flesh of a little child and he was clean. And fifthly, the living bird was then let loose in the open field to signify the leper being cleansed. He was free to go home to his family. 
He was free to go anywhere he desired. He was clean. He was no longer an outcast. Hallelujah! But the leper in our story would never have had that experience but for our wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. We have read Mark's account of the leper. But the evangelist Luke in his account tells us a bit more because he was more interested in this case. And I'll tell you why. You see, Luke was a physician. And if you read Luke's gospel, he always gives you more details. And if you read the book of Acts, Luke gives you more details. He looked at Jesus from a doctor's point of view. And he watched the master. And Luke always puts him forth as the great physician. He was the ordinary practitioner. But when Jesus is around, every other doctor sits down. Isn't he wonderful? Now Luke says that he was full of leprosy. Full of it. Luke in his gospel says that this poor wretch was in the worst and most terrible stage. He was doomed to death. But the Lord Jesus changed all that. And David in his sin, the psalmist, felt like the leper. And so he says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than the snow. Ah, Pastor, how can you be whiter than the snow? You can. Do you ever lift snow? It gathers dirt, and it gathers dust. But the man who's washed in the blood of the Lamb is whiter than the snow. Purge me with hyssop. You see, the man who was a leper, you knew he was coming, you smelt him. It was a rotting disease. The flesh rotted. It was flesh that was cracking up, breaking away, limbs dropped off. There was blood on his trail. There was stench on his trail. And sure some of us in our sin will live like that. We were rotten. If we'd only admit it. And everybody say. We were rotten. But he sprinkled us with hyssop. Isn't he lovely tonight? Isn't he lovely tonight? We were rotten. That's a good old Ulster word. And everybody understands. It's strange enough. In all the countries that I've preached. They understand what it means too. We were rotten, but he sprinkled us with hyssop. That's why we smell nice and we we'll look nice tonight. That's why our complexion is different. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Isn't he lovely? And so David said, like the leper upon whom the priest has performed the cleansing rites, I shall be again admitted into the assembly of thy people and allowed to share in the benefits of thy salvation. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. As I close tonight, let me bring the application to you. As leprosy separated the leper from his friends and his loved ones, so sin separates us from our greatest friend, Almighty God, and in the end makes God our enemy. The rich man in hell cried that there is a great gulf fixed. There was a great gulf fixed between the leper and society. But here comes Jesus of Nazareth. He stretches out his hand and he bridges the gulf. And there's people here tonight and I know you and forgive me of casting up your sin. But I can't cast it up because I was a sinner too. I remember the time when people here wouldn't have sat beside you. I remember a time when your neighbors looked at you. And even when I went into your house, they looked at me going into your house. And look at you tonight. Look at you tonight. Haven't you a lot to be thankful for? Mm. Haven't you a lot to be grateful for? And who to? To the man of Galilee. Isn't he lovely tonight? Does you no harm to have a wee quick back look to what you were? Because some of us, we forget that as Christians, don't we? 
Oh, some Sunday night we're going to have a testimony meeting here. We're going to have a testimony meeting for six months and get you all testifying. It's good to look back to the rock from whence you were hewn and to the hole of the pit from whence you were dead. And he came and he lifted you where you were. And we've become respectable. We're like the Colombians. Bill Dross phoned me some months ago, as you know. He's very interested in the Inca Indians. That's what he's interested in at the moment. And he rang me from Spain one night and he says, Jim, have you ever thought about those Indians? I says, I have. He says, what about you and me going? I says, no chance. You're on your own. Because I wouldn't be up to all the harebrained schemes that he has. He says, listen, those Colombians, there's thousands of them saved. And you know what's happened? They came as paupers and they came as peasants and they're getting respectable. It's time they needed a revival. And you know, that's us. We forget what God has called us from. And we forget what God has called us to. He brought us out that he might bring us in. And he saved us to serve him. Will you say amen? amen? Don't forget that brother tonight. Don't forget. Oh you're prospering. Thank God you're prospering. But who prospered you? You're doing well in your family. Thank God you're doing well. Who made you do well? Because look back on your life. Where did you come from? Who were you? Look at your situation. Look at your condition. You were like the leper. But he lifted you tonight. He lifted you. Let's remember these things. And at Calvary's cross, Jesus took my place and he took your place. He, the spotless one, became the sin bearer. He took the wrath and the judgment that we should have gotten, bridged that gulf between God and man. And we can have God as our friend. And God will speak to us and God will fellowship with us and God will guard us and God will guide us and God will keep us because of him who stretched out his hands upon the cross. Pardon from an offended God. Pardon for sins of deepest dye. Pardon bestowed through Jesus' blood. Pardon that brings the rebel nigh. Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who has grace so rich and so free? Will you say praise the Lord? As I close, this story has its present value. And I leave it with you. The world tonight is full of lepers. Lepers in the spiritual sense. Lepers depraved through sensuality. Through passion, through pride. Formal religion and external ceremony cannot deal with them. As a matter of fact, our social law can only deal with them as the Hebrew law did, by segregating them. Segregating them. You ever visit the Crumlin Road? You ever visit Long Cash? You ever visit McGilligan? I do the trip. Lovely young man that sinners were in. And the authorities looked on them, potential enemies of the state, potential this, potential that. And many a time as I've walked in, I've said, Lord, how do you look at them? Michelangelo used to browse with the Pope. The Pope used to finance his escapades. And then he had a row with the Pope and he wouldn't go back to him because of his pride to look money to chisel out his statues and his work of arts. And Michelangelo used to go to the dumps. Where these artists, rich artists, used to discard pieces of marble that were no good to them. And Michelangelo used to take those pieces of discarded marble and sculpture a masterpiece out of them. And the Son of God walks through life and he sees discarded heaps on every hand. And you know what he does? He takes them and he fashions them. And he makes citizens out of them and he does all sorts of things with them. Isn't he marvelous? Oh, he saw Peter and Simon. He saw Israel and Jacob. He saw Paul and Saul. And what does he see in us tonight? He sees potential. You're not that far gone. He can lift you. And he can transform you. We take moral offenders and we put them in prison and we love to do it. Or we'll have to do it in order to protect society. 
Only let us not forget that we have put them in prison for the sake of society and not for their sakes. Prison will not cleanse moral depravity or cure it. What hope then is there for modern day leprosy and lepers? What hope? The same hope 1,976 years ago a poor leper found in the city of Galilee. Bring them to Jesus. Bring them to Jesus. He's the only one who can cure and clean the sin-sick soul and cause it to live a decent and upright life. Listen to Peter. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus. Jesus. And whosoever, that's you, that's you, that's you, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I was talking to a lady at our gate the other day. She's a lovely lady, very respectable lady. She's held in you know, good esteem in our community. And she stopped me and she says, Pastor, I'm amazed at the people that's coming to your church. Good people. Very respectable people. I says, oh yes, it's all sorts of people. I says, but they're sinners, though. They're sinners. Oh, no, pastor. I says, there's all sorts of sinners. I says, there's respectable sinners. Everybody said, respectable ones. And I said, look, dear. She says, well, I'm a member of a certain church. I'm not going to say it in case I get myself into trouble. He says, I'm a member of a certain church and I do this for the church and I do that for the church. I've been a member there for 30 years and I think that God will let me in. I says, listen dear, before he lets you in, do you know what he's going to do? He's going to lift up the robe, the veneer of your spirituality and he's going to look at you. And what's he going to do? He's going to examine you to see if you have any leprosy. And it's only those that he pronounces clean will get in. And listen to me, all of you tonight, you may look saved, you may look good, but I want to ask you something, are you saved? I think I'm saved, well if you think you're saved, you're not saved. Oh, wait a minute, I think I'm saved, no you're not saved if you think you're saved, you either know you're saved or you don't. John says we know that we have passed from death unto life. Jesus said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's the gospel. My friend tonight, will you put your trust in him? I don't care who you are or what you are or where you've come from. He loves you and he wants you. And what more can you want? May God bless his word to your heart. Shall we bow in prayer? Are you coming? Is there a man? Is there a woman? Is there a boy, a girl, anywhere in this meeting tonight? Who will say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be clean. I want to be clean. 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 If there is, there's no one watching, only myself. Would you quickly and quietly lift up your hand and take it down again? We will see it and pray for you. Can I see a hand in this meeting tonight? No one was watching, only myself. Can I see a hand? That's right. Who will be the first? Do you want to be clean? Do you want the man of Calvary to touch you? Not some pastor, not some minister, not some priest, but the high priest. If there's one, would you raise your hand and indicate to us that you want to come? Where are you? Where are you tonight? Would you raise your hands? I know God's speaking. I know he's speaking. Man or woman, where are you? No one's watching, only myself. God bless you, lady. God bless you. I see your hand. 
God bless you, lady. I see your hand. God bless you. God bless you. I see your hand. Thank you. Is there another tonight? That's two. One on each side of this church tonight. Isn't that wonderful? Is there another tonight? Is there another tonight? Well, thou be clean. Clean. Not that defileth shall enter in. That's the divine law. God means that. Who are these? These are they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Who's who will get at? Is there another tonight? Is there another tonight? Is there another? For the last time now, I am asking, is there another? May God bless you. Everybody said, look at me. Will you say praise the Lord? It's not lovely two ladies tonight. Will you rejoice with us? Say praise the Lord. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it is four years today in this church that every week that men and women have come out for Jesus Christ. Will you say praise the Lord? Incredible! By the Spirit of the Lord, to Him be all the glory tonight. Say praise the Lord. We're going to pray uh, at the close. We usually do because lots of people have found help by praying like this. I'm going to pray. That lady, the other lady that raised her hands, I want you to make it this your prayer. It will give you an understanding of what you're doing. And the congregation will pray with us. And will you reign and live in my heart. Keep me day by day. Give me strength for every day that comes. Give me an understanding of your word. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to go out tonight. And tell my loved ones. That I'm saved. Give me grace to tell them. And give me strength to go on. I call upon thy name. I say Jesus. For you said. Whosoever shall call upon. The name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for saving me. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, he's lovely tonight. With five minutes left, let's do something good with it. Let's sing. Hallelujah. If I don't see you clap your hands, I'm going to throw coconuts at you. <laughs> All right then, everyone's singing and entering right in. Are you ready? I keep watching us. the Lord. I want to sing it again. Forgive this commercial. I was looking down there. Sister Edie Larkin was having a tea in her house on Thursday night. Everybody's welcome. <laughs> There'll be a queue up the church road. <laughs> All right then. Uh, if you can go see Sister Larkin and she'll tell you. Maybe there's too many going. We don't know but we're all going. We're going to eat of her. And then we're going to give a big offering for the Belton Fund. Five or a skull. 
<laughs> All right then, come on. We'll sing it again. And let's enter into it. All right then, everyone singing. You ready? All
like it. All right, then. Right. Shine I'm not. 